Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Well, I, I didn't realize that my sartorial habits were going to be a topic today, but it does remind me of a, an incident that happened a couple of years ago. I, I ran into Lynn Nofziger, who has been here, and who enjoys roughly equal renown in that department. And he said to me, this is in Bermuda, remember, at a posh gathering. Joe, it's so nice to see you. And I beamed. And he added the thrust. Because whenever you're here, I know I'm not the worst dressed guy present. <laughs> <clears throat> I said, well, Lynn, it's always nice to see you. But until you showed up, I think it was generally assumed that Bermuda had licked the problem of homelessness. <laughs> so it's his turn now. Don't let that get back to him, uh, that I told that one on him. <clears throat> the, um, this is a media age. Uh, this is the media age in a way that no other age could have been, mostly for technological reasons, but technology has a way of getting inside us too. We become uh, extensions of our own extension, so to speak. The technology that we create recreates us in a certain way, changes our whole kind of consciousness. I don't want this to get too highfalutin, but <clears throat> uh, before I uh, give particulars, uh, I, I think of a story that illustrates how sometimes the greatest changes are the least perceptible. The, uh, the great critic Hugh Kinner tells about a time, well, an incident at the Metropolitan Museum of Art a few years ago when an Etruscan horse, so-called, turned out to be a fake. It wasn't from ancient Etruria at all, but from 19th century England. And so Hugh asked the uh, uh, museum curator, well, how did you know it was fake? And she said, well, we carbon dated it, and it couldn't have been the right age. And he said, I understand that, but why did you get suspicious enough to carbon date it in the first place? And she said, well, whoever made that horse endowed it with every ancient Etruscan mannerism he could see, but also with every 19th century English Victorian mannerism he couldn't see. He endowed it with the style of his own time. And the style of your own time is always invisible as Hugh Kenner puts it. So that style that was imprinted on the horse was invisible both to the forger who, who made it and to everyone else. It looked natural. It's, it was every, everything that was distinctive, distinctively Victorian about it was invisible to the Victorians. But it, with the passage of time, of course, like fashions in dress, the style of sculpture became quaint. And eventually, a 20th century eye looked at that horse and said, that looks awfully 19th century. And they did carbon date it, and sure enough. Well, <clears throat> to me, that's a wonderful parable of how we take so many things for granted as natural. In fact, we hardly remember they're there. And with us, I think a lot of, a lot of it is in what the media say and do and assume, most of all. I think the founders of our country, the framers of the Constitution, would not recognize this country now. Uh, they might think they'd wandered into Canada by mistake if they were to return. The constitutional tradition that they established died about a generation ago, I would say. I think it can be revived, restored, something, but it will be a big job. And I'll tell you why. The original assumption of the Constitution, very simple. It has nothing to do with this controversy about original intent. It's right there in the Constitution, right there on paper. You can read it yourself. It's a list of powers of the government. And there's only one reason to list the powers of the government, and that is to limit 
the government to those powers. Most of them are in Article I, Section 8, which are powers of Congress, because most of the powers of government are primarily powers of Congress. And <clears throat> something has changed. We hear about the deficit all the time. That's only a symptom of the problem. The, the federal government now spends a trillion and a half dollars a year. That comes, I mean, that the figure is completely incomprehensible. The only way to get a grip on it is to divide it by the number of people. Divide it by a quarter of a billion and you get about $6,000 a year per capita that the federal government spends. Gee, I'm not getting anything for my 6000 I don't know about you. As a matter of fact, I pay a little more than 6000 and I still don't get anything for it. But that's the way it works now. Most of this money is spent for purposes that are not authorized by the Constitution. And this is very important. Let's consider, to take a very topical example, the Koresh cult the other day. I never did figure out why the federal government went into Waco as it did. Was it doing this for me? I mean, I always start with myself, uh, just to get my bearings. Presumably, this government represents all of us, and that means me among 250 million others. And so it's supposed to be doing something for the general welfare. Um, what was it doing for me, say? I don't know anyone else. I'm a good test case because I don't know anyone else who benefited any more than I did from it. There was something about uh, possible illegal conversion of guns. That came to seem awfully small, an awfully feeble reason in the wake of what finally happened. Was all that really necessary, I kept thinking? The rationales they gave for their action uh, kept shifting. I mean, we finally wound up hearing that there was suspicion of child abuse in the compound. Well, child abuse is not a concern of the federal government. I go by the U.S. Constitution. I don't see anything about child abuse in there. That only became a fashionable topic a couple of years ago. But we live so much in the present now, we don't look backward at all. We don't even look down to the text that has been left to us of the Constitution. I mean, there is, this is supposed to be the, our legacy. And people don't read it, don't pay attention to what it says, and sometimes when they try to read it, can't make heads or tails of it now. They've been so thoroughly brainwashed with its supposed meanings. And here again, I think it's typical of our mass media. In fact, it's almost inherent in their nature that they keep us preoccupied so much with the present that we lose touch with our past. The, uh, in the 50s, when there was, when the federal highway system was built, the question came up, well, where is, the, where is the federal government authorized to build highways like this? And so the whole program was called a defense project, because defense is at least authorized by the Constitution. It was a pretty feeble excuse, but at least they needed an excuse in those days. They had to have some kind of constitutional pretext for doing it. Now, the same thing happened with the Commerce Clause in the 1930s when the New Deal wanted to regulate all kinds of things that the federal government had never regulated before. And they used, some would say, stretched the Commerce Clause. Now, what's interesting about those two things is nowadays they wouldn't bother. They don't bother. At, at least they had to lie about the Constitution then. Now they don't even have to do that. They just assume whatever powers they want. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms? Well, at least two of those things seem to be pretty clearly excluded from the federal government's jurisdiction. Firearms under the Second Amendment and alcohol under the 21st Amendment, which repealed the Prohibition Amendment, of course. In fact, note that in the, uh, in the earlier part of the century, in order to ban alcohol, they had to have a constitutional amendment. Now they can have a war on drugs by presidential fiat. Things have changed. The government doesn't even have to have power, uh, you know, anything on paper. Um, 
doesn't even need a flimsy excuse now. This is the way we've gotten accustomed to living. And I dare say it's pretty sinister. The sinister thing is not just that it happens, but that people, most Americans, don't even remember that it was ever any different. Well, it was different 30-some years ago. That's how radically the country has changed invisibly, without most people realizing it. You have to be sort of a scholar to know this. You won't hear it on TV. Dan Rather, Peter Jennings, and Tom Brokaw aren't going to tell you. Even McNeil and Lehrer aren't going to tell you. Of course, one of them is a Canadian. Well, in fact, Jennings is too. Why do we have so many Canadians broadcasting the news here? <laughs> I never thought of that before. Those people are taking over. <laughs> Check their green cards. <laughs> well, anyway, in theory, the, the, the federal government works for us. Does anyone believe that? The truth is we work for them. If the IRS calls you in, as Milton Friedman says, do you feel as if you're talking to your servant? <laughs> now they're talking to their servant, calling their servant on the carpet. And everyone knows it. They're representing their own interests. Uh, the government is just people. I mean, there may be laws or, or not that they uh, observe or don't observe, but at any rate, they're people, and they have interests of their own. And I think that what happened in Waco, for example, and I just say this for the, for the sake of argument because I think it's typical, is that they were conscious of losing face when they picked out a target that actually fought back. They could have easily arrested David Koresh on some other occasion. And I think, by the way, there were things that the local police would definitely have been justified in arresting him for. Uh, I think that group he had was, well, his conduct seems to have been uh, just flagrantly immoral. I mean, there was child abuse, but that's not what brought the government in in the first place. And that's not what they cared about. If they'd cared about those children, they wouldn't have blared this, these ter terrifying noises at this compound for weeks you know, shine floodlights on them and all that sort of thing. That must have been horrible for those kids long before the, the awful end. No, I think they were looking out for themselves. They realized that their own prestige had been seriously damaged. They'd set the whole thing up in the first place and alerted the media because they wanted to put on a show that wasn't strictly necessary, to say the least. And I think this is typical behavior of government. This was a little more spectacular than most, but this is how it happens, because we have a kind of lawless government. People now assume, and this is kind of new, and as I say, the bad thing is that people don't even know it's new. People assume that the government may do whatever it isn't actually forbidden to do, whereas the original idea, and, the, and there's no other way to interpret the Constitution intelligibly, is that the government is able to do only what it's clearly authorized to do. That's why those powers are listed. If I give you a grocery list and it says carrots, onions, ground beef, and I say go to the store and buy me the things on the list, and you come back with, you know, ice cream and popcorn instead, I'm going to be a little annoyed. That's the idea of a list. Everyone understands this. It's not a question of digging into the archives and finding out what was really on James Madison's mind back in September 1788. We have a record of that, too, but that's not decisive. What matters is what's on the paper. It can't be read any other way. The Ninth and Tenth Amendments go together. They're really the core of the Bill of Rights, and yet they're rarely referred to by the so-called watchdogs of the Bill of Rights. And no doubt, you, well, if you went to public school, you never heard of the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. You only inferred they must be there because there were ten amendments in the Bill of Rights, right? Well, I found out a few years ago, doing original research, what they say. I have actually bought a copy of the Constitution and read it. The Ninth Amendment says that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. That is to say, this is not a complete list of your rights. 
the Bill of Rights is not meant to be complete. Therefore, you have a lot of other rights that aren't there. For example, the right to travel, the right to marry, you know, things like that. So in no way was that Bill of Rights intended to downgrade or upstage all the, the rights that we traditionally have had. On the other hand, the Tenth Amendment limits the powers of the federal government. It says that the powers not delegated, notice the word delegated, to the United States, i.e. the federal government, by the Constitution, uh, or not delegated, nor prohibited. Well, I, I'm sorry, I can't quote it directly, but anyway, actually I can. You want to hear it? Okay, by popular demand. Uh, the powers, <clears throat> just as I thought, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it, the Constitution, to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. That is, the powers, any powers not given to the federal government are forbidden to the federal government because they're reserved to the states and the people. In other words, <clears throat> the Ninth Amendment says that the, people, the, the list of the people's rights in the Constitution is not exhaustive. But the Tenth Amendment immediately adds that the list of the federal government's powers is exhaustive. So there's a presumption in favor of our rights and against federal power in the Constitution. That's gone. That doesn't exist anymore. And that's a very recent development. And I think it can still be changed, but America's got to wake up to this. It's got to start reading its Constitution and understanding its plain meaning. As I say, this has nothing to do with that original intent business. We're not arguing about what it used to mean. It, it meant, it used to mean what it can only mean. I mean, if it didn't mean that, it doesn't mean anything. It's not a question of alternative interpretations because there is no other interpretation. As I say, even the people who lied about it, about what it meant, were at least admitting in principle that they had to have authorization in the Constitution for what they did. Now they don't. Uh, I mean, um, for example, there's going to be agitation for a gay rights law this Sunday. Um, where is the federal government authorized to do th that sort of thing? Nowhere. Uh, oh, but you can go all the way back to the New Deal. and Just about everything it's done since then has been, everything it's added has been pretty much unconstitutional. Well, <clears throat> the, um, this kind of talk is considered very right-wing by the media. Notice the word right-wing. It's applied to everything from fascism to libertarianism, to monarchism, to constitutionalism of the kind I'm advocating. It doesn't mean a thing. It, it, it means things that are incompatible with each other. It just means everything that the progressives hate. Well, you know, you hear a lot of talk about media bias. Well, it's there, all right. Most of it's not even conscious. And it's this progressive mindset that informs the media. Every story you get will have this kind of twist. It's, it's likely to be a little melodrama of the progressives versus the reactionaries. The, good guys are always the progressives, the agents of change, and the reactionaries are the people who are against change. That's the way they describe it. It doesn't really fit because a lot of so-called reactionaries would love to see some changes. Not the kind the liberals have in mind, but we'd like to see some changes. And so this week, you can bet that the gays besieging Washington will be portrayed as the victims, the good guys, the progressive forces, and anyone who's against them, and they'll you know, drag up the most disgraceful opponents they can find, probably, will be represented as the villain. This will be the subtext of the news reports. Happens all the time. The media are in the business of cutting us off from history, from our own traditions. Not because they fully intend this, but because it's, it's a kind of instinct with them. I mean, they define history in terms of what they can show with a camera, in essence. They're not interested in texts like the Constitution. They're not interested in abstract principles. They're only interested in what they can dramatize. 
That's what, the, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the news media. They're not really just giving us raw information. They're giving us dramaturgy. They're working on our sympathies all the time and trying to make us decide on the basis of sentiments, some of which are sentimental in the bad sense. They'll try to get us into a war abroad on the basis of sympathy for suffering people. Well, the sympathy is fine, but it may not be a justification for war. It, it may not have anything to do with American interests. Again, the government is supposed to be working for us, not telling us what to do. But it doesn't seem to work that way. If you read the Federalist Papers, you constantly find the stress on enumerated powers, listed powers. The word enumeration occurs on you know, every couple of pages, at least. Because the assumption was that it was vital for any power exercised by the government to be listed. And that, to me, it's almost astounding that that principle, which was so ingrained in Americans until not long ago, should, should have vanished as quickly as this has. How often do you even hear anyone ask on, say, a TV talk show, whether such a, such a proposed program is authorized by the Constitution anywhere? I think I've heard that question raised about <coughs> twice in all the years I've been watching these shows, and it was by uh, Jack Kilpatrick in both cases. He once wrote a book on the Tenth Amendment. The, uh, the psychological pressure that the media apply in their propaganda is extremely intense. <laughs> you hear about the mainstream versus extremists. And it's, of course, laudable to be in the progressive mainstream and reprehensible to be a reactionary extremist. And the word extremist is usually applied to extremists of the so-called right. To be an extremist of the left, you have to, you know, uh, plant a bomb somewhere. To be a right-wing extremist, it, it suffices to have voted for Reagan. Uh, there's no competing with the media because obviously they have a tremendous advantage over the rest of us. That's called mass communication, but it isn't that. It's, it's mass amplification. Communication is a two-way thing, you know, conversation. There's a chance of, you know, answering. Uh, with this, it's like a, a guy with a megaphone debating a guy with laryngitis. Uh, the, there's no way you can really respond in kind to CBS unless you own NBC. And most people don't. In fact, there's a certain consensus among the, uh, among the networks that's very unhealthy. And thank God for cable, because I think it's finally breaking that monopoly up. But until recently, um, well, as I like to put it, things were getting awfully unanimous around here. The, uh, the media don't seem to even know that there are alternative points of view. The, there's a consensus in the major media, even now, about the desirability of federal government action on almost every occasion. There are exceptions, but even those exceptions, in a sense, prove the rule. For example, when, when you hear people say, we should get government out of the bedroom, they're really assuming that it's all right for the government to rummage through the rest of the house. <laughs> and I'd just like to keep it out of the whole house. That seems to be a reactionary notion. We were not told by the media in all the horrible 12 years of Reagan-Bush budget cuts that the federal budget was actually doubling during that time. It went from about $700 billion a year in Carter's last year to the present billion and a half. So it's more than doubled in, in dollars, although adjusted for inflation, it's not quite that bad. And again, inflation is created by the government, so there you go. The, uh, there's the constant appeal to opinion polls now, not to the Constitution, but to the polls. The media bring a sensation. They're great at that. They bring you images and sounds of the present. They can be there. They can show you things actually happening. 
And that's great. I'm all for that. That's fine as far as it goes. But it has to be supplemented by this ballast of memory, of historical memory, a sense of the past. And that is what is not only not retained by the media, but in a sense made war on. The, the great um, C.S. Lewis used to say something that chimes with the, the parable of the Etruscan horse. He said that for every, he told his students, for every new book you read, you should try to read two old books. Not because the older writers were always right or because they were any more right than we are, but just because they take you out of the tyranny of your own time, the mental tyranny of your, your own age. Uh, they, they didn't make fewer mistakes than we do, but they made different mistakes. And Lewis observed that when we study old controversies, however heated they may be, what always surprises us is that both sides in most of these controversies assumed things to be true that we would think should be disputed, as in religious controversies, uh, for example, or, well, political controversies even more so. He even suggested that from the perspective of history, Roosevelt and Hitler might not look so different as they did during the war. He suggested that, in fact, that uh, they might appear less as mighty opposites than as feuding cousins, because they did assume a lot in common. The 30s was the great era of fascism. Only some forms of fascism weren't called fascism. The concentration of power in, gov in a centralized government, the government control of the economy, was assumed to be progressive by all sides, by Hitler as well as by Roosevelt and by Stalin. In fact, Hitler almost spoke for his age when he said, it goes without saying that only a planned economy can make full use of a nation's resources. An awful lot of people would still agree with that if you didn't tell them that Hitler said it. They like to think he was the opposite of, uh, the, of everything they stood for when he was not. Well, um, I, Lewis, to me, is one of the great writers of the 20th century, a man who had the gift of studying enormous amounts of material and drawing profoundly simple lessons. I don't know why that should be so rare a gift as it is. You would think that simple-minded people would see simple things. But it's just the opposite. It seems to be a great struggle to achieve a simple vision. Even something as obvious as I'm telling you about the Constitution took me many, many years to realize. And this was when I was studying politics sort of full time, not only all day long, but you know, talking about it with my friends constantly at night and on weekends and everything. It was my obsession. And yet, look how long it took me to, to understand what was commonly understood not very long ago. It's frightening that this should take uh, takes such an effort as it does. The, um, the media attitude toward the past is summed up in words like 18th century or 15th century used as condemnations. You know, medieval, Neanderthal, reactionary, backward, hidebound, uh, etc., etc. There are dozens of such words. And they all imply that it's a disgrace to be attached to the past. They never explain why. We're always hearing about bigotry. It seems to me that there's no deeper bigotry than this summary dismissal of the entire past, as if it had nothing to teach us. The whole idea of a liberal education is to take you outside your time, to put you in touch with minds of other times, and if possible, to turn your own mind into a into a little kind of council where you can summon up the voices of Aristotle and Shakespeare, Aquinas, Locke, Hamilton, Calhoun, and all sorts of people that are worth knowing about. So you can conduct an internal conversation instead of just being 
pushed around by the cliches of the moment, I found that there is so much more name calling than I ever expected to find in politics and political controversy. I was talking with my doctor a few years ago and he said, you know, I majored in philosophy in college and the first thing they taught us was that the ad hominem argument was worthless. So then I got out into the real world and I found most people never use any other argument. I have a friend who says that the ad hominem argument is God's argument. It's the ultimate argument. But only God should be allowed to use it. Even, and this is the scary part, even conservatives accept the premises of unconstitutional government. Very seldom do they, do they raise the objection that such and such a proposed program is not authorized and therefore is forbidden. And so this forces them to argue constantly that this or that program doesn't work. Well, that's a hard way to argue and most people aren't convinced by it. It should be enough to simply point out that these programs are unconstitutional. The Tenth Amendment could be a great labor-saving device if only conservatives would learn to use it again. It used to be invoked by Southern uh, politicians all the time, Southern congressmen and senators, but it fell into disrepute because their motives were questioned, as if their motives invalidated their arguments. The, uh, essentially, the media have ridden with the winners. There's nothing sinister about their intentions. Most of the people in the news media that I've known are very nice, decent people, personally speaking. It's just that they have become so much imprisoned by their time that their conversation is entirely with each other and not enough with their ancestors that, that creates the problem. And, well, here at Ashland, I, I, I needn't stress this too much, I'm sure, because you're engaged in precisely the kind of education that's the antidote to this uh, debility of the mind that I'm complaining about. But all the same, it's good to be keenly aware that we have to keep up our contact with the past. Dr. Johnson, Samuel Johnson, said that a man should keep his friendship in good repair. I would only add, we should keep our friendship with Dr. Johnson in good repair. We should keep our friendship in the past in good repair. Finally, I'd just like to quote a very profound aphorism from the Anglican Bishop, Richard Whateley, who remarked, he who is unaware of his ignorance will only be misled by his knowledge. And I think that is more appropriate to the media age than it was to the early 19th century when he said it. Well, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to take them.